So when he's talking about women need to be silent in church, again, you need to study the words that are used in the context. It's in the same book where he's talking about women prophesying. And then a couple chapters later, women don't speak. Well, he's not, I mean, come on. channel love for you to subscribe if you can't always get these on uh, video we uh, go to my website jeremiahbullock.com and we've got a, a podcast there so all of these are on audio and you can check them out there so you can listen to it when you're on the road all right clock has started video number four women in ministry and i want to get to our eschatology stuff but i really wanted to get this out i've been promising that i would give some teaching on this for a while, uh, women in ministry. And uh, just, man, there's just not enough time. Got so much stuff we want to teach on. So um, anyway, got uh, our eschatology video is coming up pretty soon, and we're really excited about that. And then uh, a new thing we're going to be doing is uh, a mailbag. I think on Tuesdays, every once in a while, we're going to do a mailbag. So if you have any questions, uh, you want to message me uh, privately. And I think that's how I would like to do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, comments. People do mailbags on their comments, but there's some questions that are pri <laughs> really private. I got one again yesterday. It was really good. So uh, I can probably do three or four questions, depending on what they are, um, at a time. But I think I'd like to do that every once in a while, do a mailbag on Tuesdays. Or maybe do it at the end of the word and word. We'll, we'll see how it's gonna 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 pan out. But if you have any questions, and it takes you a while to type them up, uh, you know it's not gonna really fit on a on a you know response to a video. Just message me from Jerem any any of my social media from my website Jeremiah Bullock Ministries Jeremiah Bullock. You can just search it. And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna start doing those. But we're gonna get to our eschatology. Uh, I'll, I'll be recording all of December. I'll be home the whole month of December. I'll be recording probably 15 or 20 videos on the eschatology. It's going to be really good. So it's going to be a long study and we're going to do it intermittently this next year. But I really think it's important that we we need, we need like everything, we need a biblical framework in order to process um, topics that circulate in the church. Let me say that again. We need a biblical framework, a biblical context established for some of the things that circulate in the church. Just like this study here with women in ministry, we, we tend to make decisions based off of how we feel. Um, we take, you know, we, we make decisions based off of our experience, what's happened to us. Here's a big one. We make decisions based off of bad things we've seen. Well, I don't go to church because there's hypocrites there. It says go to church. It says go to church. Sorry, you don't have the option. Go to church. I mean, there's going to be a Judas in every church. Jesus had one in his. Go to church. You have to go to church. You've got to be along to a body. You cannot say, well, there's... so. We, we end up making decisions based, you know, outside of the parameters of scripture. Man, I got intense there for a minute, didn't I? Well, that's, that's important. Like we end up making unbiblical decisions, um, you know, which would be ungodly decisions at the end of the day because um, of hurt, of fear, those kinds of things. It's not good. It's not good. So video number four. Um, let's, let's make a good decision here. Let's, let's look at what the scripture says on some very difficult passages. If we can do that, we have been setting the context in videos one, two, and three. So we want you to go back and watch those. If you haven't yet, before you watch this one, it's important. And, um, we've just tried to set the context that what Jesus, uh, says directly in Matthew 19, Mark, 
chapter 10, some other places regarding man and woman being one. Uh, and that's not just about, you know, divorce. That's not just even really about marriage. Um, there's this passage. Oh, my wife sent this to me. Um, she, it was awesome. She was reading today and this is like the perfect example because, um, when we're talking about like, even as a minister, like when my wife and I are together and we're in ministry, if I'm in, in a certain aspect of ministry, she's a part of that. She feels that she contributes to that. And she, it was awesome. This is passage out of mic. This is crazy. So, uh, I was, I was in the studio, been in the studio recording and she texts this to me. And it says uh, in Micah chapter two, verse 15, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife in body and spirit? You are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to the wife of your, of your youth. That's how God feels about marriage. I was like, girl, man, killing it. That's uh, that, that was a huge thing for me today. I was like, you know, I came back and I was like, man, I'm teaching about husbands and wife being together and everything, being in intimacy. And then she sends me that, sends me, you know, I had her, had her send it to me. She shared that with me. She says, man, God was speaking to me about this. And I mean, that's, that's what marriage is. That's what union is. That's what intimacy is. That's what mankind is supposed to look like. That's the context. Jesus said, everything my father established in Genesis chapters one, two, and three is that's going to be the fabric of my kingdom. And the violation of what God, this is important, the violation of what God established in Genesis 1 and 2 came in chapter 3 with sin. And the result of sin, God said to, to, to Eve, he said, your husband, you're going to long for your husband. You're going to long for this and he's going to rule over you. So this is the result of sin. So anytime we have any conversation where this is the context, it's a sinful conversation. When in fact, men and women were created like this, in intimacy and oneness and equality. What he can do, she can do. What she can do, he can do. In terms of being um, sourced by the Spirit, there are certain biological differences. That's, that's obvious. There are certain, and, and we would call, if you want to talk about roles, for men and women, biologically, 100%. But in terms of the ministry of the Spirit, it's always talked about like this in, in the New Testament. Always. Always. This is how it's talked about. So let's get into some of this. Let's get into some of this. And we want to look at basically three passages. And the first is in... Uh, no, actually, you know what? I wanted to get... I wanted to cover a couple things really quickly here. Okay, we're have some context. In the... In the first century, Paul, and we're looking at a lot of Paul's writings, obviously, was battling not just against the culture of Judaism, which was bad, and how they treated women um, in the role of men, but also the Roman culture was also bad. And it was oftentimes, it was like so twisted by the enemy, obviously. So it was sometimes the same that was bad, but sometimes it was opposite, which was, you know, bad as well. So it's dealing with culture. For instance, um, it was a male-dominated culture. Um, women could not serve in public office, which was true. I think that changed later on. But in Jesus' day, that was true. Uh, women couldn't vote. That was true. Um, several uh, scholarly articles I read said that women could not own businesses or property or whatever. I think that's doubtful because of what we find here, for example. In other words, I don't think that was like universal. I think that there was... Money talks. And in Acts chapter 16, Paul runs into this girl named Lydia. Um, so he's he's preaching in Philippi on the Sabbath. Um, this group gathers uh, and there's some women there with them. Verse 14, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. So she was a dealer. Okay. So she was a businesswoman. Uh, she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message when she and the members of her household, think about that, her household were baptized. In other words, she has a business. She has workers. Think about that. She's a dealer in purple cloth. She's running an industry. Doesn't say anything about her husband. 
Maybe she's not married, probably not married. So she's, she's got like, like that's interesting. That seems to go against what we learned a lot about their culture. Um, Anyway, it says in verse 15, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to, uh, to her home and said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she uh, persuaded us. So they go there. In fact, when Paul and Silas get out of prison, as you go down through chapter uh, 16 towards the end, um, well, the very last verse of chapter 16, after Paul in verse 40, after Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. And if you go back up, it was her church. Isn't that interesting? So we have some of that kind of language that's going on in the New Testament. So um, there's a couple things there that shed some light on, you know, that would have never flown in Judaism, okay, in that culture. And it would never have flown, apparently, in in Roman uh, culture, okay, in the uh, the culture of uh, the church uh, of, of the cities in Asia Minor, but <clears throat> you know, it, 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 a lot of that is just so undefined. We're not so sure. History is not as definitive as we'd like it to be on that kind of stuff. Um, now, with regards to women in society, okay, obviously we have Lydia in this seemingly anomaly of a woman. I think there's obviously more. Um, I don't, I don't think that was always the case. Women with money bought influence. Okay. But what was their role in cultic worship? Okay. In Judaism, women didn't have any role, you know, I mean, you can go back in the old Testament, there's like judges, you know, there's, there's uh, Deborah, she was a judge. Okay. And God used women and those kind of things. But, you know, pretty much in, in Jesus day, women didn't have any involvement in, in ministry. Okay. So, because we're talking about women in ministry. So in Judaism, they didn't have any kind of involvement. And there were female priestesses and uh, uh, um, female temple prostitutes. um, And they represented uh, even uh, female gods, uh, the God of fertility, the fertility God. Um, So, um, you know, there were... um, there were definitely women in cultic uh, had cult that value in in uh, in worship in religious worship and cultic worship. Okay, so all Paul. What I'm trying to say to you is that Paul was ministering in that context. That's the context in which he lived, not in a vacuum. It was just all this was going on. So people that were coming into his church, both Jew and Gentile, had background baggage that they were dragging in. This is what church looked like. I remember dealing with this when I went overseas to Africa. I had this big kind of like, whoa, is this even, you know, are we supposed to be doing this, you know? And, and you know, I, like it, there was no, i give you a little bit more of this, like you can't interpret you can't interpret the New Testament in light of your American culture. For instance, they didn't have scripture like we had scripture. I hear this all the time. Well, like on Sunday morning, they gathered together and they had some songs and someone preached. No, they didn't. No, they did not. They did. They're like, well, they had the Bible. They had the Old Testament. No, they did not. The apostles, it was the, the apostles had the scriptures and they interpreted those. Paul gives us a layout of this in, in Corinth. Go read the, the letter to the church in Corinth. I mean, they... I mean, they stood up, they took turns singing songs, they took turns prophesying the word of God, which is not preaching. It is literally hearing and releasing a prophetic word. Um, I mean, this this was the early church. They did have some teaching on scripture, but that was done by those who were the apostles. Those that was that was some that was that was not as widespread that it is today. People were not walking around with their NIV Bibles. Okay, so there's just this different culture of what ministry and church look like, and you can't look at it in light of, you know, New Testament. Uh, excuse me, you can't look at it in light of, you know, um, modern day Christianity. You know, we all have our Bibles, and there's, you know, everyone has one. I mean, uh, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. You know, just not everybody, not even in Judaism, people just walked around with the scriptures out. Like they were in the synagogue under lock and key by a Pharisee. I mean, come on. See, I mean, we have this idea that everybody just had their own copy of the scrolls and are walking around reading and studying. And uh, no, it's not. They had the Holy Spirit. It was a different, it was a whole different deal in the infancy of the church. Think through that. That's really interesting. So that's kind of the context of what we're dealing with. And then you have throughout the New Testament some further context with regards to women in ministry. It's what we're looking at. So we have Judaism, 
okay, and and how they looked at women in ministry, and then we have, of course, um, you know, the Roman culture and how they looked about in their cultic worship. Uh, it was a lot of it was perverse, but. In, in the New Testament, we have places, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I think, you know, you need to be able to study this on your own as well. But in Acts chapter 21, um, we have Paul that runs into this guy named Philip. If I can find the verse, here it is. He runs in this guy named Philip down in verse 8. They're, on this, they're, they're touring. And um, verse 7 says, we continued on our voyage. This is chapter 21 X. We continued on our voyage from Tyre and landed at, in this other place where, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. And that was one of the seven that was appointed uh, back in chapter eight of Acts, I believe, where the apostles were dealing with things that they didn't want to deal with. They wanted to preach the word and demonstrate and heal and, and proclaim and do things that apostles were called to do. And so they appointed these seven men to run the daily affairs of the church. And he was one of those guys. So he's a big time this, think about this. This isn't just some guy out there. He's a big time role player in the early church. And it says in verse nine, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. That's big. They prophesied. And it's not like, well, in their room once in a while. No, that was a public thing. And prophecy was huge. Paul calls it the greatest gift. So that is a role. And some guys, I don't personally hold this to be true all the time, but some would say that prophesied was a preaching thing. I think it's Probably not like we would consider again preaching, um, but the idea of standing up and proclaiming. We're going to find that women did that regularly in church. Okay, so um, that's there. There were women in leadership ministry in the church, preaching and and proclaiming and even teaching. So the first passage we want to run through, and I think is important. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna come back to um, the Timothy letter. There's two in Corinth we want to get to quickly. Okay, there's two in Corinth. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's kind of a, a it's kind of a weird passage. Um, in chapter 11, he's dealing with some problems in the church. He's been dealing the whole a whole book with problems in the church, 1 Corinthians. And this is propriety in worship, which is a communal gathering. That's really big. This is not when you're at home in your closet worshiping, got, your, got, got our eye on you. That's not what he's saying. When the body comes together and, and there's, there, you know, there's worship going on as a body, this is what, there, there needs to be some parameters here. Now listen to this. He says in verse four, every man who prays or prophesied with his head covered dishonors his head. <laughs> okay, so I'm wearing a hat. I'm in trouble. So some of this is cultural. Some of this is cultural. It's really interesting. Um, like we don't apply it today. It doesn't mean we're bad. Okay. There's some cultural things that's going on. Um, listen to what he says next in verse eight. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's just as though her head were shaved. Okay. So, I mean, women come into church if they pray or prophesy. And again, that's in the body. That's in the service. You're like, hold on, women were prophesying? Well, that's that's like preaching. That's like declaring. That's like giving a voice in the body where God is moving. Yes. Yes. Well, I thought Paul talked, again, context. We, we interpret a lot of things that we read in light of our context outside of the context of the New Testament. So this is Paul, the one we're going to be looking at in First Timothy. This is this is him talking to churches about what's going on uh, in their worship services, where women are praying and prophesying. That's a, that's a big deal. Um, and he goes on about if she doesn't cover her head. And then there's some other cultural things that's really weird. Verse seven: A man ought to not cover his head, since he is the image of God and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. That's interesting. There's context to that. Verse eight, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man, which is interesting because he goes down, but he says, verse 10, for this reason, and because of the angels, women ought to have a sign of authority on their head. What does that mean? I don't know. Verse 11, in the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of a woman, but everything comes from God. 
So it's, you're like, what in the world? I, I'm not going to go and exegete this entire passage. You, you're a grown adult. You can study. You've got resources. But he's he's really comparing worldly relationships with what's going on in the church. And what in the Lord is a key statement in verse 11. Women is not an independent from man. He's talking about this. And man is not independent of a woman in terms of this relationship. This is how God created. Okay. The, the union of men and women in the church. Okay. In marriage, what we would call marriage. For a woman came from man. And so also man is born of woman, but everything comes from God. And so he ends up in verse 14 does not the very nature of these things teach you. Uh, that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. But if a woman has long hair, it's for her glory. Some of that's culture, okay? He's talking about culture. <clears throat> so what you're doing is you're looking in light of their culture to gain the understanding of what they're saying. That's, you know, your culture is big in interpreting how we understand one another. It's not just the words that we say. Words take on the framework of the culture in which they're given. So this this really kind of weird passage in First First Corinthians uh, chapter eleven, really from verse uh, five all the way down through verse sixteen, is he's dealing with some issues in in worship, and the covering of a head, and 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 you know the lack of uh, a covering of a head, both you know for men and women. But in the midst of all that cultural stuff. What I wanted to show here is that women were praying and prophesying within corporate worship. And praying, I guess you could say with their head bowed and they're praying. Yeah, I could get that. But it's prophecy. Prophesying is declaring. It's releasing a word, which women were doing that in corporate worship. So the idea that woman did not speak in in worship is is not, it's not true. Women were speaking and declaring and being used by God to prophesy and declare over the body. And you're going to say, well, what about the passage about not speaking? Well, he goes into that. We get that from 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 33. Um, He says, as in all the congregations of the saints. So this is not just in Corinth. This is across the board. Women should remain silent in the church. They're not allowed to speak. Now you're going to be like, hold on. They were just prophesying a minute ago. Absolutely. The word speak here, this is so neat. I, I, I I left the word study up just to show you this. Well, not show you, but I'll tell you. The word for speak is used all over the New Testament. And it's the word laleo. This is really interesting. Here, this is the word laleo. And it, it literally means casual talk. It's not like in intellectual speaking, like Lego. But everywhere where Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, where he's communicating, giving content, it's the word Lego. Laleo, which is this word, is casual chatting. It's just talking. And apparently they had an issue in this church. And he says, this is all over the place. No, okay. Women don't know how to behave here. There's no talking. There's no chatting in the church. There's no kids be quiet. There's no, hey, I got a question about this. Hey, would you tell me? Hey, I'll see you for dinner. None of that stuff's going on. I'm not saying that's what they were saying, but that's what is being, um, that's what's being emphasized. He does not say women should remain silent in the church. They're not allowed to prophesy. That's not what he says because earlier in the book, he's talking about when women do prophesy, they need to do it with their head covered. Okay. Cultural thing, the women covered thing, but they were prophesying. So speaking and prophesying are different. Comprende? As in all the congregations, Women should remain silent in church. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. Verse 33, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to chat in church. And then he goes on and talks about the details of that. So when he's talking about women need to be silent in church, again, you need to study the words that are used in the context. It's in the same book where he's talking about women prophesying. And then a couple chapters later, women don't speak. Well, he's not, I mean, come on. He's not like, 
<laughs> crazy. I don't know how you would even, I mean, he's, he's telling you there, those are two different deals that are going on. Casual conversation. There's a lack of understanding of what a worship service is. It's not for chatting. It's not for hanging out. It's, I had one, one really quickly, one scholar was really good on this. He was like, women, a lot of times were in the home, men were out working, they're managing the kids. When they get out, they want a fellowship. They want to do those kinds of things. And what Paul was saying is this is not the place for that nor is it the place for asking questions about things. Wait till you get home and listen, ask your husband. Don't ask other men, ask your husband. This is what he was talking about here. But as an idea that chapter 14 is for women not to be able to speak and and contribute in the ministry of the church, he settles that in chapter 11 where they can do so, but they have to have their head covered. Okay. So the idea that women don't speak in church, they're not able to proclaim, prophesy, be used by God. And that's just not biblical. Hope that helps. All right. The last one, see, we already got two down. The last one is in 1 Timothy. And this one's going to take a little bit longer. It is a little bit um, more in depth. It's beginning in chapter two. And again, this is in this is instruction for worship. In fact, my NIV does a great job. Uh, above chapter two, it, it, the title is Instructions for wor- Worship. He comes down into verse nine. Let's walk through this. And he, 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 he transitions, he's dealing with all kinds of things. He transitions into verse nine and he says, I want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Now, obviously we dress up to church on Sunday. We wear nice clothing. That's not the issue. I, I, there's this one passage. I don't know if I still have it in here. Um, I was looking at, and it was out of Ezekiel, and uh, I might have taken it down, but it's, I think it was Ezekiel 16, and it was God, uh, it was using this, God was like dressing up Israel and had a nose ring in, her, in, in Israel's nose and, and beautiful clothing, he was doting on her, and it was an illustration for how they treated their wives, he was treating, uh, you know, I've loved you, like it was something they could understand, and not to mention all the, the you know, decor uh, in Song of so- uh, Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Songs, when uh, Solomon's you know lavishing all these wonderful gifts on 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 his bride. So you know, decor and see, this is not a legalistic thing like no jewelry. You know, <laughs> can't put makeup on. That's not what he's talking about here. This was out of their out of their cultic worship coming not from Judaism but out of Roman society in what women look like in their pagan ministry roles, that's, they, they dressed up. It was temple prostitutes. It was women. They were in leadership. It was very perverse. He's dealing with that. We're not doing that here. That's what he's talking about. And he goes on and he says, um, instead of wearing those things, have appropriate, um, appropriate for women who profess to know God, good deeds. Okay. So he comes into verse 11 and he says, a woman should learn in quiet and full submission, which is really, really a a strong um, affront to Judaism and women who, man, they, they, they were not looked at as equal in studying the Torah. Again, it was the, because of sin, it was man over woman. And Paul is confronting that. Now, again, he says here in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. The issue is not on teaching. It's on having authority over a man. They can't teach or have authority over a man. In Titus chapter two, uh, I did put this one in here. In Titus chapter two, when he's talking about the godly older woman, verse uh, three, likewise, teach the older women. This is Titus chapter two, verse three, same guy, Paul giving instructions for all the churches in um, in Crete area, all on these island. There are many churches. And he's writing this letter probably the same time he's writing the one to Timothy. Likewise, scholars say he wrote those from the same place while he's in prison. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Now, some people say, hold on, no, no, they're teaching younger women. No, 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 verse four, it's a different word. Then they can train the younger women. They can train the younger women to love their husband. But literally, they're teaching. They're teaching. They're to teach what is good. So um, 
Older women taught. Women taught in the church. They're to teach what is good and didn't, didn't specify their um, audience. Now here, so he's not just talking about women can't teach. So people say, oh, women can't teach. You know, and they're not supposed to be teaching Sunday school. Or what? That's not, that is not what he's saying here in 1 Timothy. He says, I do not, verse 12 of chapter 2 in 1 Timothy, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Now, in terms of authority, what kind of, this is so big. Listen, zone in. In terms of the authority that a woman cannot have, that is, it's an, you, would, you really could translate this an authoritative teaching, kind of exerting authority. What authority is he talking about? This is crazy. So the word here for authority is only used one time, and I don't know if I could pronounce it. It is uh, uthenteo. <laughs> I stink at pronunciation. One time. It's only used one time in the New Testament. This word for authority. You're like, authority is used everywhere. It's a different word. This word is only used one time in the New Testament. And it, it literally means to uh, dominate or be domineering. It's the warning that women or uh, a man is going to rule over you as a result of sin. That's this idea. In Roman culture, it was a twist. That women, women were like, you know, domineering in, 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 in their cultic practices, this manipulation. He says, I do not permit any woman at all to have any kind of domineering authority over a man in our body. Not at all. They're not going to come in wearing expensive clothes. They're not going to come in in that kind of whole culture of the women and where they came from and going to be telling, they're not, we're not doing that here. That's what he's talking about. The word for authority that we typically find in the New Testament, which is used, oh my word, how many times is this thing used? It's exousia, it's used 87 times in the New Testament, 66 times it's, it's translated for the authority and, and referred to believers, both men and women in the body of Christ. We are seated in Christ. In Galatians, I, don't, I, I probably took some of these out. I do so many different studies. I end up clearing my, I have, I have a program here that I can grab several different passages. And I did, so I'm going to pull it up. If you come into Galatians, this, this is so good. In Galatians chapter three, verses like 26, I think. Yeah, look at this. Verse 26, 27, and 28. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. He had a lot, he's talking about heirs and being, you know, inheritors. Same thing he talks about in Ephesians, this tremendous authority that we have as God's children to have the Holy Spirit and be, that's the language. That's the language of authority that's used all over the New Testament. So when he says here, I don't permit a woman to have authority over a man, it's negative domineering. He's not talking about godly authority. He's talking about sinful, this sinful way that worldly women dominate and manipulate men. That's not going on in the body. And we take that kind of language and say, well, women can't preach and teach in church. Can't be a pastor. Can't be a pastor because can't have authority over a man. Like, I wish, wish you'd study. I wish you would just read and do your due diligence in the text. I mean, come on. That's not at all what he's talking about. And then he moves on and he says, for Adam, and this is so, he goes back to the beginning. Now, don't read this in light of, oh, well, it sounds like he's talking about the context we established from the beginning with Adam and Eve. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing. And childbearing means child rearing. It's not just through having kids. If they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. What's he saying? He's saying that there is a role. There is a role that a woman has in a man's life and a role that a man has in a woman's life. Adam was created first and she was taken out of Adam. When they come back together, he serves as this covering. Now, He's kind of like this covering for her. 
And for her to operate outside an independent and domineering of a man is going to open her up to sin, which is what happened in the garden. When she she operated and, and, and did not operate in oneness with her husband, but kind of did her own thing, came back and brought you know manipulation to Adam. You know, he gives us really what he's doing. He's giving us insight on what the sin of of the whole apple and Satan and temptation, what that all looked like. There was manipulation going on there. That's he's not just talking about women who can't be used by God in a service. There's a whole different deal going on. The consequences of a sinful, broken relationship between man and woman and what an ungodly woman who's manipulated in her husband looks like, what the consequences now are the same in the garden, it produces sin. That's what he's talking about. Isn't that awesome? It doesn't mean what we think it means. It's like the same kind of thing. And I got a video out there on it, or I might even dealt with it in one of these videos, but women being busy at home, people take that completely like, oh my word, they're supposed to be barefoot and pregnant in the home, flipping pancakes. Are you kidding me? That's the word busy means man, or there's two words put together, manager, like a thought of steward, and then the family. It's the word for family, oikos. She's the manager of the family of which the husband is a part of. And we elaborated, we did talk about this in one of the other videos. We elaborated on that in, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter five, where husband and wife submit to one another. This is what it looks like for a woman to submit to a man. This is what it looks like for a man to submit to the woman. He's the covering of his wife and she's the, uh, he's the covering of his wife and she's the head of the family in which he's a part. It's this mutual. That's what we're dealing with. We take these passages out of context. God was the first one. God the Father in the beginning was the first one to institute, ordain women for kingdom ministry. And Jesus in Matthew 19 said, I'm bringing that, those days back, that women aren't going to be sold as property anymore. That's not what, that's not what, that's not what God intended. That's what God's telling Micah, what my wife brought up today, intimacy. She's a massive voice. Women carry a valuable voice in the body today. Probably should cut this short or at least end it. It's not short. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, you can message me and maybe we'll uh, talk about this in our uh, mailbag session when it comes about. And I'll be touching on this again periodically, but we got to get to our, our eschatology stuff. So that's where I'm headed after this. This is the last study I'm doing for teaching. We're going for here eschatology at least six weeks. We'll probably have a break and throw some other things in there. But this is really important because I'm here. Like John MacArthur's got a bunch of junk out there. And I just, oh, my God. I can, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just so frustrated with the things that he's talking about with women in ministry. It's so sad. It's so unfortunate. So anyway, that was video four. Hope you enjoyed it. Come on!